fell in love with working individually um, with people to help them discover purpose, even above just profession, purpose and calling to serve others. And so it was interesting how God created a pathway into ministry for me doing basically that. So at Brentwood Baptist, um, I get to see an, a, oversee a volunteer team of coaches and trainers. And our job really is to help people discover purpose and calling. And so um, we have that as part of the membership, our membership process. We actually use a different set of assessments. We have, we assess spiritual gifts and we do assess personality, but we use DISC for membership. Um, but it was an entryway for me to begin looking at other personality assessments. So eventually I got certified in some others like Myers-Briggs and StrengthsFinder. And about two years ago, I discovered the Enneagram. And it, of course, as you probably all have heard, became the rage in Nashville, in large part because of Ian Morgan Cron, who is here and has been using it um, in a really prolific way to help teams and help individuals. And it just got to where I was getting so many questions about it, I couldn't not investigate more deeply. And I was a little bit skeptical about it. Honestly, the first time I took the Enneagram, I didn't love it. I didn't like that it felt like it was really reading my deepest, most inmost male and had, you know, revealed some things about me that were quite frankly, a little bit scary true. So I really began doing some, um, some work on myself and praying a lot about it. And God revealed to me that this really was a great tool for spiritual development. And it has been really insightful in my marriage with my kids. Oh my goodness, with my kids. I have two boys. Um, both are, well, one just graduated from college. The other is a sophomore next year in college. And my husband and I have been married um, 23 years. And so we just have come to a new level of understanding with each other. So I'm excited for those of you who um, are here with a spouse or are maybe looking to um, heal a family relationship any kind of understanding for others is so valuable with a tool like this. So um, I hope that you will enjoy tonight's session. We're really gonna just kind of talk through the nine types. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Enneagram and um, what all it sort of reveals and helps us discover about ourselves. But anytime we do an assessment like this, I want you to know um, especially with Enneagram, this is true, but it's never about boxing you in. No assessment should ever be about trying to summate or summarize who you are. And, you know, I don't want you to feel trapped by this because we really do have to kind of tread the terrain of our personality to understand the depth of who God has created us to be. And we are extremely complex individuals. I've been doing this for 12 years now. Um, in a ministry setting. And the deeper I go into gifting and temperament, the more I am convinced that God is a masterful creator because we are so complex and so deep. And it's amazing though, how we can see categories of behavior that help us better understand each other. So it's a both and, and it's really quite amazing. And I hope you'll get the sense of that as we go through this tonight. We will hopefully get to talk a little bit at the end about some spiritual practices or disciplines for each of the types. And so um, that to me is one of the most beneficial things about Enneagram. You know, it's never just about what some have lovingly termed navel gazing. You know, we never just want to consider uh, and self-analyze for no purpose. It's always for the purpose of becoming more Christ-like and discovering how we can support others in becoming more Christ-like and developing their spirituality. So if it's okay, I'd love to open us with a word of prayer, and then we'll just kind of dive into talking about what we can learn. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this group. I thank you, God, that they are taking time to be here tonight to discover uh, more about themselves, more about others, and I pray, God, that you would give us the understanding um, that blesses you because we love each other better as a result. So teach us tonight, Father, I pray. Would you use this instrument um, for your glory 
and for deepening our walk with you. And I ask blessings over each one here tonight and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, I'm going to put some slides up on the screen and share my screen with you. And if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to just jump in and ask. Um, I really think we benefit from hearing each other's questions a lot of times. So don't, don't be shy. I know with Zoom, it's a little bit awkward. But, um, and actually, I think I grabbed the wrong screen. Let me do one more, see if I can try again. Here we go. Let's do this one. There we go. Okay, so the Enneagram, um, Ennea means nine, and gram is just a picture. So it's a picture of nine, and there are nine types with the Enneagram. So it is a little bit more complex than most personality assessments because actually um, you can divide it into three types for each of the nine types, creating 27 subtypes. So it's a complex instrument and you can go as deeply with it as you want to, or you can just look a little bit more surface and still really gain some great awareness. So you've often probably heard about the wings. Um, wings are the, you have two wings, one on each side of your main number. So if you are a five, your wings would be four and six. Okay, sometimes people get confused and think their wing is their secondary type or the one that's second highest. Um, actually, that's not the case. Your wing is going to be at least one of the numbers on either side of your main type, but most of us do have characteristics from both of those numbers and types on each side of our main type. And those numbers really inform what our type looks like and can really kind of give us a um, distinct or originality to our type because of the way they're blended. So that is the, uh, we'll go through each one of these and I'll describe them for you. Um, but those are the wings. Then you'll hear a lot of triads with Enneagram because um, there is an element of math to this. And actually we don't really know exactly where the Enneagram originated. We know it's very old. Um, we're not sure if it was the Greeks or if it was the um, Middle Eastern philosophers who originated it. But a lot of people have speculated it was actually someone like Pythagoras because there is such a, a deep element of math that goes along with this that I won't bug you with tonight. But the triads, sometimes you'll find it divided into groups of threes, like eight, nine, and one or the body triad two, three, and four, the feeling triad, the heart triad, five, six, and seven are the thinking triad. And we'll probably talk about those next week. So you'll hear me refer to triads or centers of intelligence. And that's when we kind of break it into groupings of three. So we'll talk about those as we go through. So let me just remind us, and I think you will definitely see this, that everybody sees the world so differently. And sometimes an instrument or a tool like this can really help us just drive that home um, and recognize the ways that we really do see things differently. We see it through a different lens. And I hope that's one thing we'll gain from tonight. So um, let me just give you a picture of the differences between certain um, uh, personality assessments. So if you've ever taken the DISC assessment, DISC looks at that outward behavior. So if our personality is an iceberg, DISC really looks at what is above the surface, what you go to work with and what people experience as they're with you. It talks about the outward behavior. And then we've got MBTI, which kind of addresses personality and motivations. Um, and Myers-Briggs, that is, if you've ever taken Myers-Briggs, it has 16 types. Those three are really good for working in a work setting or a business setting. They're good for team development. But then when we get into the Enneagram, we're talking about some very, very deep aspects of ourselves. And so we're not only addressing with Enneagram all of the above, behavior, personality, motivations, but then we start getting into what our 
inner defense mechanisms are and what our anxiety and fear where it's really rooted. So this is partially why I didn't love it when I start, started looking into it because it really got into some stuff that I frankly didn't love thinking about. And so you may some find some of that. In fact, sometimes I joke that as we go through these nine types, if you hear one that you just go, ugh, that's the worst, I don't wanna be that, that's probably your type. Um, it's generally the one that you think is you know, the terrible one, just because we tend to be our own worst critic. And so bear with us, understand there are some deep things that we look at that might not be pretty, but this really does also help us identify the way we reflect God in the world and in a beautiful way. And so there's some very positive elements. Try not to get hung up on the negative like I did the first time. Okay, so let's talk about the Enneagram One. I know, Joseph, did you say you were an Enneagram One? I did say that, yes. Yeah. Uh oh, I think he might have frozen. Okay, I'll keep moving along. <laughs> there you are. Yeah. Yes, yeah. now I can. Yeah. Yes, I'm the one. Okay, got it. Okay, so um, guys, bear with me one second here. Well, actually, I'm not going to mess with it. It's telling my internet connection is unstable, so I hope I don't lose y'all. Um, so Enneagram One, sometimes referred to as the perfectionist or as the reformer, these folks have a very strong sense of right and wrong. They are very conscientious. Um, they can come across to the world as being perfectionistic. Um, because they always see a better way. And so they're always improving, always thinking of the next best way to do something. And with, because they, they have a more critical eye, being able to identify things that aren't right, that could be fixed and um, could be controlled or could be um, you know, brought into a more perfect way. So they are fairly idealistic. Um, Sometimes uh, you'll hear me talk about the high side and the low side of one and so or of each type. Um, when I talk about the high side, I'm talking about the positives, where you will be in a place where you are functioning at your best. The low side is more the way that you tend to go when you disintegrate. And so when a one is very healthy, they are really that reformer that brings excellence to what you and I are doing. Um, they are terrific at helping us improve and they work tirelessly to get things done and to finish and complete jobs. And they are generally very hard workers um, for the purpose of doing things as best as they can. So the low side of one or lower side really does um, digress into that skepticism or criticism that you know is never matched with positivity. And so can be very, um, the thing about ones is they tend to have a very, very deep critic, inner critic, who is whispering to them the ways that they themselves are not perfect. And so silencing that inner critic is sometimes to help, you know, teach me, Lord, about making this a productive um, critic. Um, so that is the one. Um, let me think if there's any other words that they're rational, principled, purposeful, self-controlled, and yes, perfectionistic at times. So my son, my oldest son is a one. He is sometimes with ones, we tend to think about, you know, the accountant or um, the person who is got to be very, very detailed at work. And yes, that's a great setting um, or career for a one, but my son is extremely artistic and his perfectionism comes in creativity. And so he makes knives, he makes all kinds of things actually, but when he works, it has to be the very, very best it can be or he gets very frustrated. So this uh, reformer can really transcend many different kinds of careers. And for that reason, Enneagram is not a great career assessment. 
We don't, it's more going to tell you how you will do your career than what you should be doing. Okay, so we use it more for coaching and uh, personal development, spiritual development than we would career assessment. Any questions about the one? Okay, let's move along, talk about the two. Twos are our helpers. And twos are, um, they really gain and feel the best sense of self-worth self from investing in others and um, being supportive and giving of their time and energy to support what others are doing. So they're caring, gregarious, generous, friendly, warm-hearted, relational people. Um, they tend to um, offer their help on the low side of the two. They offer help sometimes when help is not wanted or asked for. Um, sometimes they're not sure how to receive. So they're so sort of bent to um, give that it can be very difficult to receive in return. So they, um, you know, that seems like it would be a tremendous quality and oh my goodness, what a saint these twos must be. But the sin of the two actually is pride because it's very hard for them to, um, to recognize their own needs and to acknowledge that to other people and let others in. So twos, um, let's see, what other good things? Focused on affirming others and meeting needs. Um, again, a lot of their self-worth is based on being able to help others and uh, to be needed. So they're interpersonal, demonstrative, people-pleasing, um, and sometimes even a little possessive. They're very serious about their relationships. And so the high side of two is a person who really reflects God's love to the world and doesn't expect anything in return. So they rely on God to fill their needs. They acknowledge their needs when they have them and they're willing to ask for help. Um, so twos at their best are really um, important in our world in terms of helping and loving others. Any questions about that? By the way, I didn't mention this, but Joseph sent out the uh, handout if you didn't get that, um, that should be in your email. You can download basically slides that I'm going through right here. So you can refer back to those. All right, let's talk about the three. Enneagram three is the achiever and um, sometimes referred to as the performer um, because they are extremely action-oriented, ambitious individuals. And so they are all about achievement and success, um, productivity, efficiency. They are ambitious, um, focused, adaptable, shrewd in terms of understanding how to make something happen. So they really are um, good at achieving the goals that they set for themselves and others. Um, they want to have this image of having it together, um, being successful, um, making things work getting things done. So threes oftentimes can be kind of chameleons in terms of um, reshaping, reforming themselves to be what someone else needs in order to get a job done. So for that reason, it may be difficult for a three to identify their own feelings, even though they're in that feeling triad. Remember I said twos, threes and fours are in the feeling triad. That means um, they really, some actually they're what we call a counter type. They are the type within that triad that's a little bit backwards in terms of what their center is. So threes actually have kind of a difficult time identifying their own feelings, but they're very shrewd at identifying the feelings of others and sort of matching or morphing to that, to be able to be in congruence or in a productive relationship with that person. To but it is quite amazing when it comes to being productive. I have a good friend who is a three and she is, uh, she 
very ministry minded. When threes are ministry minded, they can achieve tremendous things. A lot of times threes are actually senior pastors. Um, they find themselves as CEOs and VPs. Um, they are oftentimes natural leaders. And so they really are basing their self-worth on what they can do and get done. So back to my friend, Janet, she's very ministry minded. She ended up building Um, needed interview clothes and did this in the like warp speed out of nothing. It was really in about 18 months she built this for a church. And so just incredible getter dunners. And um, they can be a little bit on the low side, like a steamroller, you know, getting done what they want to get done, um, regardless of relationships that might be hurt in the process. But a healthy three learns to bring others along, learns to identify their own feelings um, in the midst of things, and can really be a productive person. Questions about three? <clears throat> All right, let's move ahead and talk about the fours. Personally, I think fours are maybe one of the most complex, fours and nines to me, um, because fours, are deeply introspective. So twos and threes are kind of focusing on other people's feelings. Fours are really deeply introspective and in touch with their own feelings. Um, they have a deep connection to their emotions and they really desire to be authentic and original and to be able to be self-expressive. They are extremely um, creative, not always in terms of artistry, but just in terms of seeing the world different than most people do. They're intense people, emotional, um, expressive. They really do want to go deep into things. They don't like surface um, engagement. And so fours really want to be original. They want to be special. Um, they want to be different. So in some ways they can be a bit nonconformist. Um, they base their self-worth really on how authentic they can be and how original. Um, they're sort of always waiting for real life to begin. You know, there is um, always a better future for a four. And so sometimes the low side of four can be sort of melancholy and maybe even a little overdramatic. But a healthy four helps us really explore the deeper things in life. And it doesn't shy away from pain and sorrow and can really walk through that with people in a way that is very special and powerful because they're not afraid of those deep emotions. Um, we have a pastor on our staff. I don't know if y'all are familiar with our church. We have a ministry called Kairos for Young Adults. And um, our pastor for that group is a four. He is one of the most creative people I've ever known in terms of the way that he can explain scripture and the way that he um, brings a new angle and applies it in a new way. So fours really do have um, quite an opportunity for demonstrating things in different and new and creative ways. Any questions about the four? also have a four friend. Um, as a mom, she tells me that every morning she wakes up and for her kids, especially in this whole COVID crisis, she has wanted every day to be creative and unique. And so they place a lot of pressure on themselves really to um, do things that are different and special. So lots of giftedness there with that creativity. I think we had several fives on the call, which is great because fives are also kind of a um, smaller group percentage wise of they they're the I think the smallest percentage of the types, all nine types. So fives are very objective and they strive to understand the world. They want to explore, they want to learn, they are more intellectual. Um, cerebral, I like that word. 
they are very curious. Because fives have sort of a limited amount of um, resources, and I would say that in terms of energy, they wake up in the morning sort of with this tank full and then a reserve tank. And if they have to get into that reserve tank, it can be very scary for a five because once they run out of energy, you know, they don't have the energy they need to think and to learn and to take the world in and process it like they um, really value. So um, fives conserve resources. And for that reason, they are somewhat more detached at times. They have to go away to recharge. And, you know, they may find themselves going to bed at 8.30 at night. And that's okay because they've got to make sure they've got that reserve tank when they wake up the next morning. Um, so for that reason, they can be... Um, cautious with themselves and what they give of themselves um, and be a little bit more detached. Um, but detached does not have to mean separated. And so um, fives oftentimes on that low side can find themselves sort of isolated, you know, like a castle that's fortified with a moat and a drawbridge that's pulled up. And so it can be at times that they really do um, need to guard against isolation as they pull away to learn and think and process. One of the greatest gifts of the five, though, is really being able to be objective and being able to look at the world through the lens of um, rationale and thinking and to process um, separate from emotions. But a healthy five can also tap into those emotions and process those, you know, with some pretty strong and powerful um, ways of applying feeling. Um, let's see what else to say about them. They're knowledgeable people. Um, <laughs> I have a friend who is one of the most genius philosophers. I think I've ever met. He is a five, um, knows something about almost everything. He is brilliant and loves to study and just consume information. And so he jokes with me about teaching Enneagram classes at seven o'clock at night on Wednesdays and says, well, you won't have any fives in that class. And so, <laughs> and he's never been in one of my classes at 7 p.m., but we have several tonight. So I am excited to report to him but I have some fives on the call tonight. Any questions about the five? Sometimes they're known as the investigator. Very perceptive, innovative, thinking systems, that kind of thing. All right. Moving along to sixes, our loyalists. Sixes are contingency planners. They are people who are extremely aware of their surroundings and aware that the world is a dangerous place. So they are often thinking about what can go wrong and how to prepare and plan for it. Um, they're very careful about who they trust, but when a six buys into a relationship and decides that you are trustworthy, they become um, very much bought in and loyal to you. And so once a six buys in, decides you're safe, then you're in. And so I, you want to be cautious and careful with that, though, because sometimes it's hard for them, the six, to retract that. They may continue to buy in even when that person proves that they're not worthy of that loyalty. So um, they protect themselves and they protect those around them that they love, their families, their friends. Um, they are very responsible people, cautious can sometimes on the low side of six result in anxiety and mistrust and skepticism. And so the high side of six though, um, trust that God is worthy of trust and looks to him for guidance in that contingency planning, believes that ultimately he will be in control even when it seems like everything is out of control. And so, Sixes are good friends. Um, they can, you know, especially parents, I think, who are sixes, 
can sort of borrow trouble on behalf of their kids, you know, and maybe be overly cautious with them at times. Twos and sixes tend to be our, our helicopter parents at times. Um, and so they are, you know, always trying to think of the best way to make things safe and to do things the best way. Who did you say the other number was? The six, the six and the what are helicopter the parents? Yeah, my wife is over here throwing her hands up in the air right now, like owning that really, really well. So, well, you can tell her I'm with her because I'm a two and yeah. I was a desperate helicopter parent. So, yeah, I'll just be right with her. Hey, Michelle, I, I have a question. Yeah. So I'm a six, yes, uh, and I've taken I've taken all of, all of these tests, and and they're they're pretty similar, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. However. I served in Army intelligence uh, mm. for almost ten years. Yes, and so, mm. so I got to wondering how, how much of this is a natural bent, and how much how much of this is externally influenced. Great question. Uh, I love that question because Enneagram in particular really does strongly take into account our nurture, our life experience. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's looking not only at what you were born with, you know, that temperament that we're all born with a hard wiring, right. but also takes into account all those life experiences we've had that have shaped and formed who we are. So I would guess that the thing that I haven't quite figured out, Jason, honestly, is what comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, did you go into military intelligence because you're a six? Or did you become a six because you were in military intelligence, you know? Right. Um, I don't have the answer to that. It's perplexing and fascinating at the same time. Um, I think sometimes we do gravitate into a career that really does kind of fit our natural bent. So good question though. And I love that. And for that reason, Enneagram is not the best tool for children. Um, right. possibly teenagers, but really until we get into our 20s, we don't really have a big enough denominator or set of life experiences to allow us to tap into where we really are on this. So, sure. good question. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Any other questions? Is it possible that you can change from one to another? Like maybe you... So you were a two or a one, and then you moved to a seven yeah. or eight. I want to say yes and no. Um, <laughs> nice, safe answer, right? <laughs> um, I think we can mistype and sometimes think we are something, but then sort of discover, hey, wait a second, this is really what drives me. This is really where my motivation is. So I think I'm actually this. So um, I do think there is a theory out there. I don't want to get too far off on this tangent, but there's a theory called tri-types. Tri-types say that you actually have one type within each one of these centers. See how we've got the action center, the feeling center, the thinking center that you'll probably identify with more. And one of those will be your dominant but the other two will be very prevalent. For example, I'm a two through and through, but I very strongly agree with the nine and the seven. So um, I think it's worthwhile to look at those others that you kind of really resonate with too and see what you can learn about yourself from those. To me, it's not about, you know, do or die, find your type. It's more about what can I learn to verbalize about myself to others and what can I own and then how can Jesus either use that in me or reshape and transform that in me does that make sense so it's great good question Tina all right let's talk about our sevens our enthusiasts these guys are optimistic they are living life as a series of opportunities so Sevens are always forward facing. They're always thinking when they're on vacation in Italy, they're thinking about, hey, the next vacation I think I want to take is going to be to Rome or to France. You know, they're thinking about 
all the good things that life has to answer, offer and how they can grab onto those and take advantage of what this world can offer. So they are um, keen, they're very aware of the world um, and they're observant. And so I don't wanna give you the impression that it's just, that a seven is kind of just the party animal. Um, most, that can be true. That's kind of the low side of seven, who's just maybe venturing into the world of hedonism, where it's this world of excess and too much partying, too much food, um, too many vacations, that kind of thing. But sevens can also be great visionaries and they're good at thinking about what something could become. So they are more uninhibited. They're generally fun people to be around because they are more adventurous. So they believe that they deserve a lot from this world and they're not afraid to go after it. And they don't want to be hemmed in. They don't want to be fenced in and have a bunch of restrictions and you know, told that life has to be serious all the time. They don't want to get bored. They don't like pain, you know. Um, so for that reason, again, the low side of seven can have difficulty um, sort of dealing with their pain and grief and suffering. They might just, they might be inclined to dismiss it or tamp it down. Um, but the high side of seven learns that they can process their grief through their positivity. And so they can become very um, good where a four can help a person walk through a very deep thing because they can go deeply into those feelings and emotions. A seven can kind of say, hey, yes, this is real. This is where we are, but don't lose hope in the future. There is a positive tomorrow coming. So sevens, we desperately need you right now in this darkness we are facing <laughs> all these crazy things this world has thrown at us in 2020. Any other, any questions about the seven? Okay, let's talk about our eights, challengers, sometimes referred to as um, powerful controllers. Um, I like challenger better because I think um, we sort of have a negative connotation with control, being controlling and for, for good reason. That can be a positive thing. But eights very much have a presence, a powerful presence about them. And they are assertive, direct, decisive, self-assured. They are large and in charge a lot of times. And they really are um, going to be in control of their situations because they view um, vulnerability as weakness. And they don't like that. They want to be strong and they want to come across to the world as being strong and confident. And so they often take charge of situations. You know, threes are natural born leaders, so are eights. And so for that reason, you know, eights sort of have this, they can sniff out weakness as well. And they don't really think fondly of people who are weak unless they're being mistreated and they're an underdog in which case the eight clicks into the protector and is very, eights are very big on justice. They do not like unfairness or mistreating the weak. So it's kind of this duplicitous thing. They're not going to mistreat the weak, um, but they're also not going to maybe respect them as much as they would as somebody else who comes at them with power and directness, but they're still going to protect them and not let anybody else harm them. So eights um, are not afraid to challenge others. They're not afraid of conflict. Um, I have a good friend who's an eight and she, um, she said she, she doesn't like conflict and says, well, who does like conflict, but I'd much rather have conflict than I would have injustice or, um, somebody who's, you know, misusing the system. Um, so eights are very powerful people to be around and have a real, you know, sense about not letting things slide. So they're probably going to be a little bit more confrontational. 
The high side of eight though is a person who knows how to di diplomatically address things and um, protect and take control. And so the learning to have that more relational side can really be a good thing for an eight. Any questions about that one? Okay. All righty, let's talk about the nines. Can I actually ask, yep. ask a question about the eight? Yes. So if they're good at finding weakness, would they be people, could they on the low side be manipulative toward people who are weak because they would see that and use that to their advantage to get them to, to do whatever they want them to? I think probably. I think more likely. Um, threes can sniff that out too. And a three might be more willing or more uh, apt to do that on the low side. Eights would be more likely to just be dismissive. Like, I don't have time for that, you know, um, in that low side. Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess with you. They kind of write people off. So it's more, I think, dismissive, probably inclined than manipulative. I don't know, do we have any eights on the call? You wanna speak to that? No? Okay. All right. Let's hey, talk Michelle, about it. This is, uh, this yeah. is Chuck. I, I did want to ask, it's not yeah. specific to eight. You talked about the wings. Yes. Uh, in, in, but also as a five, I've got this line that goes to seven and a line that goes to eight. Where, where does that come into play? And if you're going to get into that later, I don't want to get you off topic, but I, I was kind of curious, how do I get, get to eight? I Yes, I'm so glad you asked that because that is actually one of my favorite features of the Enneagram. Those lines basically give you patterns or pathways to growth. So um, just because Chuck mentioned the five, um, the lines go up to seven and eight. And so older Enneagram theory says that you have you know, in these two lines, one of the line goes to a type that you disintegrate to in stress. And one of the line goes to the um, one that you should learn characteristics fun from to be stretched or to grow. Newer Enneagram theory says, actually, we can digress to either side of those two numbers, those two types. And we can also look to those two types to help us grow. So we will talk about that a little bit, hopefully tonight, if not tonight, next week, um, because there are really some powerful things to glean from looking at those lines. Um, they basically let us know, here's probably what's going to happen when I'm stressed out and I'm tired and I don't feel good. And here's also, if I look at the high side of that number, here's some ways that I could probably grow. So. Let me give you a quick example. Um, fives tend to be more isolative, um, a little bit more guarded. Um, the eight can be a growth pathway for a five because eights are prone to speak out, to say what they're thinking, where fives may not naturally do that. So a five can look to an eight and go, okay, an eight's gonna speak out about the things that they think. And I probably need to do that too. Or they can look to a seven because sevens tend to have more fun. They tend to bring people around them and create group settings. And that can be a growth pathway for a five to integrate some of that into their behavior. So we call those lines the lines of integration. And we're basically looking for patterns um, from those types that we can integrate into our behavior in order to grow. That's a really long explanation. I hope I didn't it's lose y'all. It's <laughs> very good. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. Thank you for asking that question because I realized I really hadn't addressed that in the beginning and that's so important. So we'll spend more time looking at that. Let's talk about the nines. Nines are our peacemakers and nines are probably the more, most apt to mistype. And the reason is because they resonate with every single one of these numbers. So if you have sat through this presentation and you've thought to yourself, well, I'm one, well, I'm also kind of two. Well, I see a lot of three in myself. Oh yeah, and I have four qualities and I see five. 
then you might be a nine because nines tend to adopt um, the characteristics of others. They tend to merge themselves with others. And the high side of nine, that is such a powerful thing because nines can really identify with anybody. They can find common ground with just about anyone. And they can be comfortable with lots and lots of different kinds of people. And the low side of that, though, is they sort of lose themselves. They don't really know what their preferences are. They don't think about what their needs are because they're constantly thinking about what other people need. So they're kind of like twos in that way. So nines um, are more, they're, they're non-aggressive, they're more accommodating, they're patient, they're harmonious. Um, they are, you know, really conflict avoidant. And so the thing about nines that is so profound is they can be peacekeepers or they can be peacemakers. And there's a big difference. The high side of nine means that they learn to move into that conflict and use those gifts to help resolve conflict. They're not afraid of that conflict. The low side is the peacekeeper. I'll do anything I need to do. I'll let you steamroll me, run over me. Whatever you need, I'll let it happen for the sake of keeping peace and harmony. So nines are pretty complicated. Um, I have a son that I believe is a nine um, because I'm mom and because he's a freshman in college, he's not all that into Enneagram because I am. So he doesn't want to take an Enneagram assessment, but I see a lot of these characteristics in him. Nines also say yes to a lot of things that they really mean no to. So, you know, I tell him, I need you to clean the bathroom. I need you to clean your room. Can you please make sure the driveway is swept out? Sure, mom. Does he do it? No, he does not do it. So not tattling on him. Hopefully he doesn't hate me for talking about that, but it is, it can be kind of a complex thing because you're never really sure what's going on in the mind of a nine. They're not, especially an introverted nine, won't speak a lot um, about what they're th thinking and feeling because they really believe that they don't, they're, they're somewhere along the way they adopted the um, feeling that their needs, their feelings were not important. Okay. So questions about the nine or any one of these types? Michelle, I wanted to kind of go back to Jason and Tina's questions. Um, yeah. In my research about the Enneagram, I've heard one of the tips was if you are trying to decide your number, um, to think back about before a lot of your life, your adult life experiences, Mm -hmm. and think about your motivation then maybe as a teenager or a very young adult um has that been your experience as well as helping people yes and point their number i think if you think back to about 25 is maybe a good age because you've had some life experience um but you're still you still have enough energy to be you know yourself and to exert that on the world um, in a little bit more powerful way maybe or profound way. So yeah, I think that's kind of a good thing to look at. Um, I don't know. I think again, it goes back to the treading the terrain of your personality and just over time really thinking about, it's noticing what you notice, you know, um, taking time to observe why do I do the things I do? Or what, what does really drive me? For me, you know, trying to decide for many years, am I a two or am I a nine? And when it gets down to it, what's more important to me? Is it more important to have a connection with people for people to like me? Or is it more important for me to have peace? Well, um, I will move into conflict if somebody steps on my toes and I get tired of it, no problem. You know, so um, kind of there are some basic motivators, which I will be happy to share with you. Actually, that might be a helpful thing as we've gone through these. Um, let me see. Um, 
Give me just one second here. Why are you looking for that? I yeah. have a question. Um, yeah. Now, are there different types of Enneagram test? And if so, are all of them about the same? Will you get the same number on all of them? Or how does that work? Great question. Um, there are many different kinds of Enneagram tests, and some are better than others. Um, there are also a lot of resources on the internet that are not great Enneagram resources. So kind of have to be careful because there were some men in the 60s and 70s who studied the Enneagram from a psychiatric standpoint and also from a spiritualist standpoint who attached a lot of junk to it that isn't really necessarily originally intended. And so it's, you can get into some real new age stuff. Um, and so I have to be careful with that in Enneagram tests at times. I really like uh, the WEPS test, which is the Wagner's Enneagram. Uh, it's from a Christian perspective. Um, there are some that are more neutral. They're not Christian, but they're also not none of the new age stuff attached that is a little bit more expensive. You can pay up to $100 for an Enneagram assessment. I don't think you need to do that. Um, there is one out there though, this drives me crazy that it's got a really new age name, but it doesn't have any of the new age stuff in the assessment. It's called Eclectic Energies. Um, it's probably the best free assessment out there <laughs> and it gives you your subtype. So don't read anything else on the site, but you can take the assessment and not get that stuff attached to it, if that makes sense. So um, I'll follow up though with Joseph and send out some of these resources to you. There's also some good um, tests or as assessments in books. Um, I think Ian Cron has one in his book called The Road Back to You. And I think there is one also in Marilyn Vansell's book called um, Self to Lose, Self to Find. Those are both excellent resources. And Marilyn Vansell is re-releasing her book, Self to Lose, Self to Find, and it comes out, I think, September 1st. So you can pre-order it on Amazon, but... I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a minute and find a couple of slides really quick. Anybody have any questions while I look for this? Okay, I'm going to show you a few of these slides, which I think are Interesting. I'm not always the best computer person, so forgive me for taking a second. How are we doing on time? Got a little time. Okay, this is um, the idealized idealized images, and so. Um, these can help us understand those things which we really think will, if I can get this to be true about myself, then I am living my best life. So one, say I want to be right. Two, say I want to be helpful. Threes want to be successful. Fours want to be unique. Fives want to be perceptive or knowledgeable. Sixes want to be responsible or vigilant. Sevens want to be happy. Eights want to be able to do it. And nines want to be settled. So going back to trying to sort of identify, um, Tina, I think you were the one that asked about that. Um, if you can sort of get to the bottom of what do I really want? That may be the type for you to explore as your main type. But you know, I recommend, again, if you've got two that seem like they're really close together, 
spend some time in both of them. See what else we've got here. Let me look. Yes. Um, here are some of the morals and values um, that are really idealized by each type. Or another way to look at this is this is the characteristic of God that you display to the world in your type. Okay, so of course, we all are much more complex than just one characteristic that we sort of display, but this might be the thing we excel in most. So you can kind of look at those for your type. Okay, so when you're on your high, oh, go ahead. Um, okay, sorry, <laughs> we had a question. <laughs> yes, ask away. Can you hear us, by the way? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, so I'm a four wing three, okay. so, which are both like in the feelings, like all of the time, which is annoying. Yeah. Uh, so how do you come to peace with, say, if you have a really strong um, wing tendencies? Like I have really strong three tendencies, and so I can be kind of like at war with myself a lot of times because threes and fours are really different. Yes. Great question. Yes, your wing at times can kind of contradict your main type. And therein lies some of the complexity of our personality. So she just asked about being a four that really values, you know, being able to go deep and inward and be authentic. Um, but then you have the three next to it, which is saying, just get it done at all costs, you know? So the way that her main type um, would interpret that is, yes, she wants to get things done. Um, yes, it's important to be effective, but not at the sake of authenticity or originality, you know? So you look at what's most important to the four. It's being original, um, and really being something that is special and unique, which will never be sacrificed um, by the cutting corners that the three sometimes does. But it is gonna mean that you probably have a lot stronger bent to accomplish than say maybe a four wing five, which would have a lot greater desire to learn and not maybe act upon the world as much as a four wing yeah. three. I wish I said like earlier, I wish that I was a four wing um, five because <laughs> fours feel too much, but fives mm -hmm. don't feel enough. So it would be, it would be really cool to be able to balance myself out, but it's okay. <laughs> I hear you. Trust me. I'm that two wing three. So I get you on that. Good question. So your wing really does, you know, it takes a little bit of thinking. Um, one of the reasons I love coaching using the Enneagram is it really gives us some handlebars to kind of dive deeply into what, how did God masterfully create you and what have your life experiences adapted in you and how can you both use that for his glory and also know what you need to get on your knees and pray to him to help you transform and change. So it's good to study those wings, those types on either side of your main type. See what you can learn about yourself from those two. Great questions. I'm going to go to the next slide because I think blind spots are so important. This is not at all what I plan to talk about, but I think we still have time tonight. Um, your blind spots are the thing about you or the thing about the world that you tend to either not acknowledge or be able to see or dismiss. So ones tend to be sort of um, avoidant or avoiding anger um, that both they feel about the world and also that inner critic has created some anger within them. So um, they tend really to not want to acknowledge at times their anger. 
which then can create that lower side of the one. Twos don't want to acknowledge their own need. I cannot tell you how many times I have said to someone who has apologized to me for going on and on and on about their life. And they've been like, I'm so sorry. I'm talking about all my problems. I legitimately would rather hear about someone else's problems than think about my own, you know? So it can almost be that you, you sort of become a stranger to yourself and your own needs. That pride is a blind spot for twos. Failure for threes, they just cannot acknowledge failure. It's do or die for a three. And so giving up is a no-go. It's just what is the other, what's the way around it? Fours really don't like anything ordinary or mundane. Um, and so sometimes when it comes to routine for a four and just paying bills and washing dishes, they can sort of tend to have a blind spot to the importance of those things. Fives, it's their emptiness. So when a five becomes very, very isolated and unhealthy and hasn't um, maybe had interaction with others, hasn't acknowledged any kind of need um, to be with others, they can deplete. And it's really hard for them to acknowledge that. They just continue to isolate. Sixes turn a blind eye to, this is really interesting. Sixes are a little bit, this one's a little bit hard to explain. Um, sixes will, it's a little bit what I explained earlier. They're very skeptical and very cautious and not going to buy in until they buy in. And then they get trapped in the buy-in and sometimes can't let go or see that someone actually um, was unworthy of their loyalty. And so it's hard for them to let go even when they should. And so they can sort of get entrapped in that loyalty. So it's both a rebellion, rebel, you rebel, and then I buy in, but I'm entrapped. Sevens have a blindness or a blind spot to their pain. Again, it's talking about it's difficult to acknowledge pain and suffering and might just dismiss it, not deal with it. Um, eight cannot acknowledge vulnerability or weakness. They just find a way to mask it. Um, I've often heard that, you know, eights, despite their tough exterior, they're, you know, they do have a soft inner core. It's a little bit like a marshmallow wrap, wrapped in barbed wire, you know? So they, it's scary for them to have vulnerability. And nines cannot acknowledge conflict and sort of fall asleep to it and just don't deal with it, put their head in the sand, sweep it under the rug type thing. So hopefully that is helpful to look at some of those. Any questions? Looking at some of these things can kind of be helpful in terms of, um, again, identifying your type, seeing what is um, that main thing that you might tend to avoid. I'm gonna go back to this guy again, and we're gonna look at some spiritual practices for each type, and then we'll finish up for the night. Let's go back to one. So you have these in your um, packet. But I believe one of the most important things that we can sort of identify as we look to integrate other healthy behaviors from other types, but also to sort of see where those blind spots come into play. Um, first thing, and we'll talk about this for each of the types. What do we need to confess, really? What can our type lead us to need to confess, need to acknowledge in our time with Jesus, in those prayer times? and in those times of reflection. Um, ones can need to confess anger and sometimes a condemning spirit, guilt. Um, you know, guilt is not the same as conviction, um, insecurity, blame, that inner critic telling them that they're wrong or blaming others or self-righteousness. And feeling like, you know, sometimes they mask their own inner insecurity with feeling like I have to 
show myself to be self-righteous or as righteous. Um, ones, it's okay to admit you're wrong and it's okay to be wrong. And in fact, some of the best growth can come from learning and releasing yourself to be wrong. And that's sort of where, you know, one's lines go over to the seven. The seven can help a one grow by, because sevens aren't afraid to be wrong. If they're wrong, oh, well, try something else, move on, you know? So adopting some of that attitude for a one can be very freeing and very helpful. Also, the one needs to play. So there's that seven again, that line of integration over to the seven. Um, and practicing gratitude. One of the most healing things for the anger that a one can feel about the world is a gratitude journal. Um, I've talked with a friend who's a psychologist and he says that one of the best things he's done as a one, every night as he goes to sleep, he thinks of 10 things that he's grateful for. And that's how he falls asleep and puts him in a totally different frame of mind the next morning when he wakes up. So, and also giving grace, you know, recognizing in those moments where you feel angry at the world because it's not perfect, releasing yourself from having to have the gavel, you know, and being the judge and jury. And then detachment. Um, just try letting go, recognizing this isn't my burden to bear. Okay, I'm going to move on. Don't want to miss getting to talk about all nine, but I'll answer some questions. So write them down at the end um, if you have them. We'll talk about them then. All right, for twos, twos often need to confess that pride. Um, they need to acknowledge they have need and that it's okay to let others meet that need and to let God meet that need, most importantly. Um, twos need to confess their anxiety, you know, carrying others' burdens for them, the martyr complex. They need to confess shame that they feel. That is a core driving emotion for a two, and it took me a while to figure this one out. Um, how can you have pride and shame at the same time? Actually, your shame creates pride, and it's, I'm not good enough to have need, and so therefore, I won't have any need. I'll just meet others' needs. So that's how that crazy progression goes. Um, but they can also confess their need to be attention-seeking and to have approval from others. Self-care is a great spiritual practice for a two. Um, you cannot give from an empty well. Our pastor consistently says you have to give from the overflow that you've gotten from being in the presence of Jesus. So twos really need to make sure they're spending time with God, allowing him to fill them up so that they can give from that overflow. Intercessory prayer. This was a big one for me. When you can't do anything to help, this can be a real release to know I can pray about this for this person and that legitimately will help. It's the best help I can give them. Compassion, um, and that's self-compassion. Finding practical ways to show that to myself as well as others. Um, hospitality, knowing that you can invite others in and you can give without having to receive anything from them. And detachment, kind of like the one um, knowing when something is not your burden to bear and knowing that sometimes helping can hurt. And I learned that in my parenting. If you're always going to do your kids laundry, they're not going to do their own laundry, right? So that's the two spiritual practices. Threes. Um, and by the way, pay particular attention to your wings for these as well, because those wings can play into your spiritual development as well. Threes, threes need to confess deceit at times, self-promoting, um, making themselves look better than they might actually be, workaholism, anxiety, um, guilt, frustration, cutting corners. Um, for twos, threes, and four, the driving emotion is shame. And so believing that they are not enough without being more. And so that is oftentimes easy to hide behind if, and that's such a deep subject, but confessing that shame is a three that I have to accomplish or else I'm not worth anything. Um, a good spiritual practice for a three is honesty and just being the real you and knowing what the real you is and then letting the world see that. 
not having to self-promote and be better. Um, also, you know, not living in secrecy. What if your validation was found in Christ instead of others' approval? So learning to admit to both yourself and to God and to others that you're not maybe the success that you always portray. Um, the presence of your own, sorry guys, I got to move my window here. Um, presence of your own feelings. Don't let others' feelings become yours. So understanding your feelings and not, you know, becoming that um, chameleon. Slowing and patience. You don't always need to make quick decisions. It's okay to slow down and to think of all the angles and to take time. And that's not actually inefficient to do that. Fours. Confession can often involve um, the envy that force can feel. You know, someone else's win is not your loss. So just acknowledging that it's okay that somebody did something great and you can do something great too. And there's plenty of pie for both of us. Um, again, that shame that we talked about, addiction, and that can sometimes be, you know, excesses in emotional um, things and even in sorrow. You know, sometimes fours can take things to the nth degree, especially as it pertains to emotion. Or resistance, being the nonconformist. Gratitude is a great spiritual practice for a four as well. Reminding yourself of the beauty among the ashes or, you know, the ways that you um, may have failed, but God has given you that experience. Um, vision Divina. I actually... I did not make these slides and I meant to go read about this one before, but I sense that it probably has to do with appreciating the beauty of the world and the creativity of God and the amazing artistry um, in the world that the Lord's created it can be very filling for a four. Um, presence of the ordinary. In other words, you know, not judging the mundane, just embracing it, doing it, recognizing there's so much value in it. Praying with a cross, um, and this, I think, signifies that fours really are able to identify with sorrow and suffering better than anyone else. So letting yourself resonate with the suffering of Christ and how that can change um, others and how you can use that gift to help people walk through suffering. All right, let's talk about fives. <clears throat> fives often, um, one of the um, vices for a five or the passions is avarice or greed. And that is just sort of it can, the low side of five can hoard resources, hoard knowledge, hoard energy, um, hoard intellect. So letting God, understanding that you don't have to hoard those or be, um, have avarice for those, um, self-protection, risking so that others can come inside and see who you are. Um, confessing fear. Five, six, and sevens, the core emotion or um, driving emotion is fear. So they experience that in different ways, but fives are afraid they're going to run out of resources. Um, the presence of people. So a spiritual practice for a five is learning to you know, you may not ever just thrive on being with people, but learning how to allow others to come in and to experience life with them. Um, naming your feelings. A lot of us need to do that. Twos need to do that. Threes need to do that. Fives need to do it. Um, a lot of us avoid feelings and emotions in different ways and for different reasons, but that can be a good spiritual practice. Um, empathy and compassion. So developing more empathy where and sympathy where you put yourself in the shoes of others and understanding that detachment should not necessarily be total disconnection so you need to stay connected to others we are built to live and to need others so acknowledging that need can be really helpful all right sixes confession again we see fear there so where fives are afraid they're going to run out of resources Sixes are afraid they're not going to have a plan. They're not going to be safe. And so they self-doubt 
even though they are some of our best problem forecasters that will doubt them, that in themselves, they may judge um, themselves very deeply and judge others as being unsafe. And so just, I think the confession hopefully leads to trust that God is able and he is good and we'll take care of them. So practicing love, prioritizing others over your insecurity, you know, learning to detach from that insecurity and that fear and risk loving others. And then knowing when to withdraw when it's not safe because you made a wrong decision about buying in. Scripture memory to combat anxiety and fear, very important for a six presence of God. How can you remind yourself of God's sovereignty and mindfulness, you know, telling yourself truth. Cause I think a lot of things run in the back of the mind of a six and that they might not recognize as happening. That just creates this sort of anxiety or a generalized anxiety. So asking and twos need to do this too. Also threes need to do this mindfulness of, okay, what is what am I feeling right now? What is happening in my head? What lies am I allowing to just run rampant? What do I need to take captive and make obedient to Christ? So that's what we mean by mindfulness. Join a committed group. So gathering with other believers, again, not isolating out of fear. Whoops. All right, sevens. Confession often revolves around, unfortunately, gluttony, which means you know, excesses of I don't food, drink. See, excuse me, I don't see yeah. seven. Uh-oh, oh, let me get back there. Um, let me, there we go, resume share. Thanks, Tina. Mm -hmm. I hit a button on accident. And by the way, it's getting dark in my room and I'm not gonna go turn on the light. So if I look like I'm <laughs> a ghost, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so for a seven, um, confession of gluttony and fear. Um, for sevens, fear manifests in fear of missing out. So FOMO, um, fear that I'm never going to have enough, that I won't get enough out of life. And so sometimes that leads to addiction um, and escapism and rationalization. I'll just rationalize it away and I won't go deeply into the emotions that I have surrounding the, the grief that is in my life right now. Fasting can actually be, and sevens are groaning right now at fasting because yuck, right? Who wants to forego those great, I've never met a seven yet who isn't a foodie. Is anybody on the call who's a seven? And are you a foodie? I got to go to Scandinavia with two guys who are sevens. And man, did they take our group out to really crazy food. So, and I mean, it was all an adventure. Um, but fasting can really be a practice that helps remind us that really this is, it is about being with God and it is God's world. And so just to reframe our thinking, fix our prayer. So discipline um, with prayer, but also just allowing God to be with you throughout the day. Sobriety and simplicity, um, you know, not doing a lot of spontaneous yeses. S sevens just love life and they just want to say yes to everything. And so learning to pray about those things can help a seven be more effective. And then stability, you know, really bearing with those commitments and learning to be um, solid in them. All right, eights. Um, Practices for the eight. Confession often involves, and lust is the passion of the eight, and it's not lust as in sexuality. It can be, but it's more about um, just this passion and zeal that can just become overwhelming um, in their life. Just everything is huge, you know, it's big, it's important. And so sometimes having to acknowledge that, um, you know, everything is not as big as the eight might feel about it. And so anger is um, the vice or the driving emotion of the eight, eights, nines, and ones. Their emotion is anger, where five, six, and seven is fear, and two, three, and four is feeling, or is uh, shame. Um, confessing the, the guilt that they feel um, for maybe not 
and this is an interesting one, eights will tend to feel a lot of guilt for not accomplishing enough or not protecting enough, not um, matching whatever that lust in their life is directed to. So the presence of people, eights have a way of, you know, isolating as well. So it's really good for eights to learn how to do life with others and to not be dismissive of people that are, you know, less strong than they are. Trusting. Um, how can you invite someone in? Not an easy thing to do because trust um, infers um, vulnerability. So empathy and understanding. Um, listening first, reacting later. And so, you know, it's sometimes for an eight and for a three, it's ready, shoot, aim. So taking time to think through those things before taking action and then detachment. It's okay to let go of control. Let somebody else have control. And then finally, last but certainly not least, are nines. Spiritual practices for them, confession. Slothfulness is interesting for a nine. I, I don't like that word, but what it basically means that the nine does is they fall asleep to themselves and they fall asleep to the world when it's something that they don't, that they want to avoid. So oftentimes a nine will need to confess that being asleep or the apathy or avoidance or detachment that results from just falling asleep. Naming your own desire um, seems kind of backward, but the spiritual practice really means that they learn to tell people what they want and what they need. Um, practicing the presence of yourself, there's that mindfulness again. Don't avoid what's going on in your mind. Ask yourself, what am I thinking? What do I need right now? What's running in the background? Loyalty and assertion, express yourself, meaning sort of it's okay to make a firm, firm decision and set down on that. And then also spiritual direction or friendship, having people that you will reveal yourself to and you will talk to and show yourself to and not fall asleep um, to yourself in that. So questions about these practices. Wow, we are right at time to be done. But I will happily stay. If anybody needs to go, please go. I won't feel bad, but I'll answer any questions you have. Michelle, I did notice on uh, seven, yes. uh, it was about confessing escapism. How does escapism, escapism with a seven seems contradictory to me. It seems opposed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the seven will escape the... Um, hard things of life or the mundane things of life. And so they will, you know, it may, it may, they may let something overtake it, like going out, you know, and partying or taking that extra vacation, you know, when really they need to buckle down and do life, do the hard things in life or walk through grief or acknowledge suffering. Does that make sense? Okay. It, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I, I'm not sure if you're going to cover this next week, but uh, uh, so I'm a six. Mm -hmm. However, uh, when I'm stressed, I lean more into three. And when I'm relaxed, I lean more into nine. Yes. So it's, you know, when I'm relaxed, it's go along to get along. And when I'm stressed, it's, it's, uh, you know, keep your head down and drive on. So, yes. to, uh, so the interplay of that, uh, you know, and I've also got the wing to, to five. Uh, so for me, I, I really have to pay attention to just how much I'm it, well, not isolating myself. Uh, because that can get me into real trouble uh, in a hurry. Mm -hmm. So it, can, you, can you talk about the interplay uh, a bit, or is that something for next week? We will. We can address next week a little bit more about stress and um, stretch. Um, okay. But I think the key thing is, again, going back to that notice what you notice. I think you've had some really great awareness um, around the go along to get along versus the put your head down. 
And then just recognizing where, where is that unhealthy mm -hmm. in my life? And, um, you know, what, what, if anything, to me, always the key is taking these things to God and asking, is there something I need to do with this, you know, knowledge about myself? Um, do I need to change this? Is this unhealthy or deviant from the way that you want me to respond? So um, I think, you know, then again, the other part of that is the people that you do life with and talking to them about, does this, how does this work for you that I am acting in this way? How would you rather see things differently in the way that I deal with things? So um, also, I also think it's very helpful to be married to a therapist, not, <laughs> not my yeah. therapist, but a therapist. Yeah, so. good. Good job. Well, yeah, you know, I think that is a wonderful statement. I, sometimes my husband will be like, are you coaching me? You know, <laughs> so sometimes it's not productive, but in my realm, but I am so glad you feel that way. That's a great thing. Good question though. And we, we will talk, I'll make a note to talk a little bit more about that next week. Okay. And maybe Great. even send you some resources about it too. Great. I appreciate it. Yes. Anything else? You guys have been so great. I feel like I've yammered and yammered and yammered and it's been no, this, wonderful. So this good has been question. so good. So good. Thank you. Yes, my uh, pleasure. So, um, and also, guys, if you have questions that you didn't ask tonight, feel free to jot those down, and you can send them to me, um, or you can uh, be prepared just to ask them next week, and I think that would be okay too. So, yes, excellent. I'm happy to. Um, I'll make sure that. Yeah, feel free to give them my email address, Joseph, and if you'd like to delve a little bit deeper into this, we have some coaches that we can connect you with, you know, if there are specific things you want to talk about. So let us know if that's something you'd like to do too. So awesome. great. Awesome. Is it okay if I pray as we end? Yes. All right, well, let's do it. Father, thank you so much for this time that we had together tonight. Thank you for how you created each and every one of us unique. God, it is no coincidence that we are complex because, um, because we have a creator who holds all things together and knows all things much more than we do. So even though we may never completely understand ourselves, we know that you do. So thank you for that, Father. And tonight, uh, thank you for Michelle and just the wisdom that she brought out to us, God. Thank you for um, all the things that we were able to learn tonight. Just let us continue to just be like sponges taking things in. And um, as we prepare for next week, just let us be prepared to learn more about how, how we can relate to you and how our personality um, just just thrives with, with you in it um, as part of our lives. In mm. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Thanks for being here, everyone. Mm.